Well, welcome once again to Graceway Baptist Church and to our Sunday School lesson. This is for June the 11th of 2023. And we're going to uh, take what Paul says here in uh, Galatians in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, as we move into this. And we're actually going to go back, uh, if you have your Bible, to Acts chapter 15. And uh, we're going to look at the historical, contextual situation behind what uh, Paul said. Now, from time to time in the church, controversies come up, as you can imagine, and sometimes disagreements. And uh, people ask, you know, every once in a while, why are there so many denominations? And it's because different people think different things, believe different things, and come to different conclusions about things. They're, they're not all the same. Now, there was a time when there weren't any uh, denominations, and uh, it was called the Catholic Church, but it was with a small C, not a capital C, because it wasn't run from the Vatican or it wasn't anything like that at all. And um, it was just, they were just all considered, you know, one church in many different locations. Uh, Catholic means universal, actually. And so uh, all of them were kind of one body and yet local churches. Now, the local churches in the New Testament, they had their own autonomy, they had their own government, their own elders, their own pastors, you know, that type of thing. And um, they were not part of a big organization that didn't really exist. However, we find that many times they would look back to Jerusalem and back to the 12, the apostles, for clarification on certain things because uh, the Bible had not been completely written yet. And so they didn't have a reference point for any of those things except the people who had walked with Jesus. And the head of the church was James, the half-brother of, of Jesus Christ. And so uh, from time to time, they would gather or go back there. And that's what Paul makes a reference to. Now, one of the other things that happened is um, sometimes there are disagreements between believers that are just kind of like family disagreements. You know, you may have all of your family is together. They're sitting around the dinner table and uh, they're talking about, you know, who they want to uh, run against Joe Biden in the primaries, and they may have different ideas about that, but it's all still family. You may disagree, but it's a family disagreement. It doesn't kick you out of the family, or shouldn't anyway, and it's not the kind of thing that causes a huge rift. It's just a disagreement, and some things, even in the church world, uh, are family disagreements. For example, if you think about somebody like um, uh, Paul David Tripp, we've shown some of his videos here in the church, and he's a Presbyterian. Alistair Begg is a Presbyterian. And uh, there may be some differences that we have. They baptize babies, don't agree with that, and we certainly wouldn't do that. And they baptize by sprinkling, and we don't think that's exactly the right way mandated by the Bible. But it's not an issue of salvation, is it? We uh, disagree with them, but we agree on the gospel. It's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone. And uh, that's different than somebody who says, you must be baptized in order to be saved. Okay, now we've got a difference because that violates our understanding of the gospel and what the Bible teaches that we're not saved according to, uh, I think it's Titus 3, uh, not by works of righteousness, it says. And uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we look at other things like, uh, then when did the thief on the cross get baptized and how did he make it to heaven? There are things like that that uh, actually change the gospel. If somebody says that you have to trust Christ plus anything else in order to be saved, and you have to do something to complete what Christ started, 
uh, you know, it's, it's almost like if you think of a football analogy that uh, Jesus is a quarterback and he passed the ball to you, but you have to catch it and run it across the goal line. You couldn't do it without Jesus, but at the same time, it also means that Jesus couldn't do it without you. Does that make sense? And so, well, when it comes to these kind of things, issues have to be settled and uh, churches divide and uh, denominations are formed around certain core beliefs. And so uh, that's, that's why that happens. Now, even in the early church, you know, everybody says, I wish we could be more like the early church. Oh, well, that kind of depends. If you're wanting me to go back and pastor the first church of Corinth, no, thank you. If you are thinking about some of the churches in uh, Revelation that Jesus spoke of, some of them were good, two of them were good, I believe, and the uh, others, not quite so much. And uh, so they had their problems as well. They were humans. And uh, then you think about the fact that they were under extreme pressure and extreme persecution. And there were, you know, when you're running for your life, when you're living in caves and doing things like that, uh, you know, you can have some wacky ideas come up and you can have some oh, disagreements about them, but how do you ever really solve them? It's difficult when <coughs> being a Christian is illegal and you can't get together in a council to meet for it. So uh, it, the councils, the main church councils, there were about seven of them, didn't really start until 300 AD after Emperor Constantine declared Christianity the legal religion of Rome. Then they're not under persecution. Then they are able to get together and they're able to hammer things out about the Trinity and those kind of things. But the forerunner of all of that is found in Acts chapter 15, the first council, the Jerusalem council, and it was settling the most basic issue of all. What is that? How in the world do Gentiles get saved? Is it only for Jews? And do Gentiles have to then become Jews in order to be accepted by God, to be justified before him? And you know, really, if that is true, you and I are in a lot of trouble because I don't know too many of us that keep Jewish rituals and religions. And it's easy for us to just pass it off and say, well, we're not Jewish and that's Old Testament, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters if the Judaizers are right and it matters if we're just going to, you know, play a little game and everybody just do what you want to do. Like the book of Judges, everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And a lot of that happens in the church world. People think they are free to choose whatever doctrines and whatever gospel or anything like that, that, you know, it's just free. And it's almost like if I'm... Um, looking around and uh, I'm looking at all the different denominations and I look at the Catholic uh, denomination and I go, wow, I've got to keep the seven sacraments of the church in order to be saved. Well, too much work. I'll find something that's easier. So I find maybe a United Methodist Church that doesn't believe much of anything and say that's much easier. Well, what if I'm choosing between two things that are wrong? What is the definitive source. It's got to be settled what it takes to be saved. So that's what we are actually talking about here. They had to get this settled because uh, these people were causing tremendous trouble in the church. And these Galatian believers were Gentiles after all. And you're asking them to do some extremely difficult things. And so uh, this is what we're going to look at today is about the first church council. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, we'll look at chapter 2, uh, pardon me, Galatians 2, I meant to say, verse 1. And um, we're going to talk about another trip to Jerusalem. And it says, then after 14 years, we'll read the whole paragraph. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. 
And I went up by revelation, the spirit of God prompting him to do that and communicated to them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation that by any means I might run or had run in vain. In other words, if Paul is preaching a gospel to them and the apostles go, nope, that's not right, Paul, you're wrong about that. The Judaizers are right. Then everything Paul has done among the Gentiles is worthless. It's empty up to that point, isn't it? And he wants this cleared up. And so uh, it says in verse three, yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek or a Gentile was compelled to be circumcised. Titus didn't feel like he needed to do it and neither did Paul. Verse four, and this occurred because of, now this is strong language, false brethren, false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour or any short period of time that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay, that's the setting. Now we're going to read about Paul actually going to Jerusalem. And uh, that's found in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. And we'll just break it down, point and the scripture uh, for each one of these. First of all, they went to Jerusalem and they had to settle this. Number one, because of an attack on grace. Now, Paul is a grace man. Paul is all about the undeserved, unmerited favor of God given to us through Christ. Uh, D. James Kennedy said grace, if you take G-R-A-C-E, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace has nothing to do with us except being the recipient of it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We don't qualify for it. We don't get ourselves in a good position to receive it. Grace is not a football thrown to us that we catch and run across the goal line. Grace is something that Christ has done for us. God's riches at Christ's expense. Undeserved, unmerited favor of God. Okay, now that's what is happening here. Look at Acts 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea, that's where Jerusalem was, and were teaching the brothers in Galatia and other places, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, what's Paul going to do with that? That's confusing people. That is stirring things up. These uh, Jewish people who claim to be Christians, but Paul says are false brethren, so that settles it. They came down with the air of superiority and an air of knowledge, and they uh, talked to these Gentiles here who are relatively new and relatively ignorant about Jewish tradition and the history of the faith. They don't know much about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They don't know Isaiah 53 or any of these kind of things. They're just doing what Paul said. And Paul was just telling them that Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, was punished by God in their place, bore the wrath of God until it, the cup was drained. And then he said, it is finished. He was buried and then he rose from the dead. And if you will put your full trust in him alone as Savior and Lord, then you'll be saved. So they're just doing what they were told to do. Now these people come and say, well, yeah, well, not until you are actually uh, going through the rite of circumcision and keeping the Jewish feast. You've got to do this in order to be saved. They were adding works to it adding works to salvation. So this is a matter of grace. So the question is, did the death and resurrection of Jesus <coughs> accomplish anything or not? Well, they would say, well, of course it did. 
And uh, it's like uh, you got the ball on the one yard line. You caught it and now you just run it in. And it's not the main thing. The main thing is what Jesus did. But you've got to run the ball in. You've got to somebody might say you might you've got to cross the bridge. Well, there's a problem with that because salvation will either be a gift or it is earned. It's it, it's it's that simple. One of the two. And both can't be right. It can't be both earned and a free gift from God. So think of it like this. Jesus plus anything is not and cannot be salvation by grace alone. Okay. So what that means is that these Judaizers are saying, unless you were circumcised, you can't be saved. So a person says, uh, well, we believe the same thing about Jesus. Yes, we do. And we believe in what he did on the cross for our sins. Yes, we do. Well, I'll believe that, but I'm not going to be circumcised. Well, then you can't be saved. So what does that make salvation contingent on? Jesus and his perfect sacrifice or the act and ritual of circumcision? You see what I mean? It means then that... Uh, it's not really about Jesus. It's about what we do. So point number two, based on verse two, is what we would call a time to fight. There's a time when you've got to stand up. You've got to be counted. You, <coughs> you cannot back down. You cannot compromise. You cannot fudge on this because this is eternity, folks. This matters. And it says in verse two, after and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. See that? That means they really got into it. They really got into it with these Judaizers. After Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed by the church to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. This is not something you can just agree to disagree on. This is not something you can just say, well, you know, we all have our own opinions. This is life or death. This is eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. This is right versus wrong. If Paul is right, then the Judaizers are wrong. If the Judaizers are wrong, then uh, are right, then Paul is wrong. And so this has to be settled. Who are we going to believe? What are we going to preach? What does it take to get to heaven? And so um, this is a time to settle this. And the Judaizers claim to have apostolic backing. And that's what the point is about them coming from Jerusalem. They didn't just come from anywhere. They came from headquarters. They came from the place where the men who walked with Jesus were, were there where the brother of Jesus was the head of the church. And as they came to Galatia, they started saying, yes, we are here from James and the apostles. And uh, we're, we're just curious. What is Paul telling you? What have you been taught about salvation? And then they go, oh, that's so close. But uh, like uh, horseshoes, hand grenades and atom bombs, close isn't quite good enough. You're just almost there. Let us give you the secret. Let us give you the information that'll get you across the goal line and secure your salvation. And um, that's, you know, the dissension that comes up. Now, as Paul found out about this, he met with these people, he and Barnabas, and they had, notice the text says in verse two, no small dissension not just no small discussion that did take place because it says debate there. They went back and forth on it, but dissension. It means they could not come to a point of agreement on this because it's either one way or it's the other. I was meeting with some Mormons one time and after it became clear we weren't really getting anywhere, I said uh, to them, <coughs> look, here's, here's the deal. If you are right, I'm okay because I'll at least get into your third heaven. But if I'm right, you're going to die and go to hell. Now, look, 
We both can't be right. We both could be wrong, but we both can't be right. Will you please think about that? And I shook hands with them, and that was the end of the meeting. Well, that's the situation here. They cannot both be right. It's got to be one or, or the other. And so coming here and saying, we're from Jerusalem, and that gives us an extra punch on all of this. Well, then the church's answer was, well, then we'll send our guys to Jerusalem and we'll let them settle this. And so they're going to go to the source. And do you know, in most dissensions, most times when you disagree with somebody, if you will just go to the source and talk about the whole problem and be honest and not vague, sometimes I try to counsel people. Well, what's the problem? Well, I think that she is acting in an inappropriate way for a wife. Well, what in the world does that mean? I mean, I can conjure up all kinds of ideas on that. And uh, that's when I usually say, no, sir, you're going to have to be more specific. And uh, one time a person said, well, I don't really want to cause any trouble and I don't want to get too detailed on that. And I said, then I can't help you because I'm just guessing right now. I've got to know what the situation is and what the problem is. And so that's what Paul and Barnabas and Titus are going to do. And they're coming up there about this question. They're up front, they're honest, and they're clear. You have to have clarity to fix a situation. And this is all for God's glory and the salvation of souls. Number three. I've uh, made this point, convincing proof. Look at verses three and four. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought joy, great joy, mega joy, to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles, and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. So think about them. They're, ju they're just doing everything right here. I mean, look at the bullet points under here. They had the backing and were under the authority of the, of the churches. They weren't just doing this on their own. They were sent. They were commissioned to do this. You can also notice, too, they had clear fruit and compelling testimonies. In other words, this wasn't just theory. This wasn't just a debate. This wasn't just settling something <coughs> that could be put on a piece of paper. This was something that not only did they preach, but also it was backed up by changed lives. Gentiles converted to faith in Jesus from worshiping uh, Zeus from worshiping Apollo, from worshiping Aphrodite and things like that. How do you do that? How do you get them to do that? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, just like it was in um, Acts, where was it? Acts 11, I think it was, when Peter goes to Caesarea to meet with Cornelius and all of those people, and they are saved, and then the same act of the Holy Spirit that took place at Pentecost it didn't happen every time, but it happened this time. Happened to the Gentiles, to Cornelius and the other Italians. Why did that do that? Because it had to be the same thing in order for it to be confirmed. Gentiles would be saved just as Jews were. And uh, that's going to come up in this council. So they've got these people and they've got their testimonies, the fruit. You know, uh, for you to have credibility as a believer, your life and your lips have to work together. If your lips say one thing and your life says another, then your testimony is no good. So they've got to uh, match up. And they had that here. And it was about God. It was about his truth. It was about the gospel. And it benefited and built up the new Gentile believers. <coughs> Pardon my cough. This was not for Paul's personal gain. What did Paul get out of this except heartache and prison, <coughs> betrayal, all kinds of things like that? 
Paul's life was much easier before he got saved. Paul's life was much easier when he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And uh, had he just, I mean, if the Judaizers are right, then what's Paul doing all this for? Why is Paul taking the hard route and the hard road on all of this? In fact, as traditional as Paul was and as zealous as he was, you would think he would be joining with the Judaizers saying, yeah, let's just make them all to convert to Judaism and then add Jesus to it and then be saved. But Paul is the one going to war for the freedom of the Gentiles that nowhere does the Bible or the gospel command people to proselyte to Judaism and then embrace Jesus. It's Jesus and Jesus only. Does that make sense? And so they've got to get this taken care of. Number four, we've got a showdown. But some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, that would be the Judaizers, and remember, Paul was a former Pharisee, so again, that's my point, that you would think that if they were right, Paul would have fit in with them. But look what they did. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and uh, to order them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter after there had been much debate. So there was a lot of debate that was taking place even in Jerusalem. And uh, think about this. These people that were of the Pharisee party, they were beloved by the apostles and others. They were probably close. They were probably related. And uh, th this is difficult. And uh, this is what happens sometimes on difficult situations. Now, sometimes we divide over unimportant things. We've all heard the stories about churches who divide over the color of the carpet. Or as I've told you before, a church I used to pastor just a few years ago uh, split over where the offering was going to be taken. Some people wanted to do it at the end, and some people wanted to do it after the third hymn so that they wouldn't have to take up their own time to count the money. They could just do it during church. Apparently, they didn't like preaching very much or worship very much, and they didn't want to take up any extra time for the cause of Christ, and they split over that. Well, this is not the issue that we're talking about here. And notice that the debate was settled, we're going to see, with logic, first of all. And uh, here's what it says. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith, not actions. Therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers or we have been able to bear? Boy, what a great point. If circumcision were necessary to be saved, then Cornelius and the Gentiles under Peter's witness would have had to have been circumcised and become Jews before they received the Holy Spirit, but they didn't. God put his stamp of approval on them right away because they trusted him by faith. And then Peter uses logic too to say, do you not know the Old Testament? It's a story basically of failure after failure after failure after failure. Human beings cannot and do not keep the law of God, not even the Jews. So they had to offer lambs and blood had to be shed. Innocent blood of the unblemished lambs had to be shed to cover their sin. Every time they offered a sacrifice, it wasn't gaining them points for salvation. It was an admission of their failure. And so Christ came to be the ultimate sacrifice for sins. And so uh, now you get the point on all of this. Our doctrine and our theology must make sense. 
and it also must be consistent. And that's what Peter is arguing for. What you are teaching, Judaizers, is not consistent with the Old Testament and the way our fathers lived or what's happened in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit came on Gentiles. Now, secondly, notice that it's got to be grace alone, not works. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Now, alone is a very important word. Almost every cult and every uh, aberrant denomination of Christianity, apostatized, uh, uh, apostatized denomination, they will say, oh yeah, there's got to be grace. But if you add the word alone to it, for example, ask somebody who is a devout Roman Catholic, do you believe you have to be saved through Jesus? They will say yes. Ask them, is it Jesus alone that saves us? Is it grace alone that saves us? Is it faith alone that saves us? And if they're honest and know what they believe, they'd have to say no. It's Jesus plus keeping the rituals of the church, plus keeping the sacraments of the church. And so uh, grace alone, that's uh, whatever you add, baptism or like my Seventh-day Adventist relatives, the keeping of the dietary laws and worshiping on Saturday, they believe you have to do that in order to be saved. Well, that's not grace because alone is a very important word. And if it's a mixture, then it ceases to be grace and it's actually not a gift. It's earned, it's deserved. It's also got to be according to scripture. This is how they settled it. And all the assembly was silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related that what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James, the brother of Christ, the leader of the church, replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, that's Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, as it is written. See what he's doing? He's appealing to scripture and showing that even the Old Testament backs up what Paul and Barnabas and Titus are doing in Galatia. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that is fallen. I will build its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So this is not just some convenient concept that Paul dreamed up to say, well, we can get more Gentiles if we make it easy. That, that was not his strategy. This was not seeker sensitive. This is the plan of God. And James quotes out of the book of Amos to show that this was all along the plan of God. The Judaizers were wrong according to scripture. That's the final word. And God specifically says Gentiles, which wouldn't be accurate if they became Jews. Once you take a guy in Galatia and make him a Jew, he's no longer a Gentile, he's a Jew. God says he's going to call out Gentiles. And then notice that they settled this by loving concession. And he says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses um, has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, James is not saying, don't do this or you're going to hell. He's simply saying, look, you can be saved just like we are by faith. But do me a favor. Don't stir up trouble that's unnecessary. Don't borrow trouble by eating things like that that are just offensive to your Jewish brothers. Don't uh, do things that are going to stir up trouble by people who were raised in this tradition. I mean, be loving in all of this. 
And you remember in Romans 14, when the issue comes up about eating meat offered to idols, Paul's big thing was, look, don't fight over this. Let people do according to their own conscience. Kind of like um, shopping at Target. Leave people alone. Let them follow their conscience. And uh, other convictions that come up, if it's not clearly in the Bible, leave them alone and don't stir up a bunch of junk and division in that. Leave it to God to deal with them. And that's what James is saying here. The sexual immorality, eating foods that are, you know, uh, not kosher in this regard. What are you doing? You're just stirring up trouble between people that ought to be in agreement. Don't do that. The loving concession is what he appeals to the Gentiles to do, which is something that we certainly could learn. And so what can we learn about the importance of uh, taking a stand? And what can we learn about what love demands, the loving concession? And what do we learn about settling a dispute properly? Well, we learn a lot in here, and most of the time people violate those kind of things. My way or the highway. I'm right and I'm going to crush you. There can be no variance in what I think or what I believe or what I understand. And you conform or get out. No wonder we don't have more effective evangelism. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we'd, we would all be one. And he said that by the love we have one for another, the world will know we're his disciples. And this is a perfectly brilliant application of the truth of the Word of God in settling a very important issue. Now, they're not going to compromise and say, well, we're both right or anything like that. They settled it. Paul is right. But they also said to the Gentiles, yeah, but don't rub your liberty in the faces of people that are your brothers that are going to be offended by it. Let's have some unity. Well, I'm not giving in to all of that. That's not very loving. And so that's what he appeals to. So uh, that's a good model for us. And it also tells us too, on our end of things, if it doesn't have to do with the gospel, maybe we are making mountains out of molehills. But if it does have to do with the gospel, it's time to go to war. Now we need to be careful how we do it, we're to speak the truth in love and we're to be patient and we're to be kind in that. But we've also got to be firm and unbending. There's only one way to get to heaven and that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the word of God alone. Okay, so I hope that helps you and I hope you've enjoyed this. And may the Lord bless you teachers as you teach this. And for those of you who are watching to keep up with your Sunday school class. We look forward to having you back. And may the Lord God bless all of you richly in Jesus' name.